Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, quick presentation on astronomy and culture. My name is Ben Coley. Um, I am a Fogaza professional field guide and have been in the South African tourism industry for approximately 15 years now. Also a registered trainer and assessor of guides. Um, and I'm also the owner of an astro tourism company that is based in Nelspreet by the name of Celestial Events. Um, and something that I've always found is unfortunately lacking in the guiding community in South Africa is an appreciation of the night sky and the stars. We are very fortunate that in most game reserves, light pollution is at a minimum. Um, and the whole idea just becomes synonymous with the safari experience about the uh, holistic nature, the reconnecting with nature, spending time in the African wilderness under the African night sky is a really spectacular opportunity and something that I hope um, more and more lodges are going to be looking into and adding to their list of offerings as we go. So Celestial Events, uh, the company that I represent, uh, we have various uh, tendrils and facets of uh, astro tourism. We do night sky safaris, which are visual and optical um, evenings, as well as uh, astrophotography tuition. Um, and then the Fugaza astronomy training, which from a guiding perspective has obviously been um, very popular in this drive to uh, increase guides awareness and knowledge so that they can share that with their guests. Um, and that's culminated with a new qualification that is available for any guides who've got a Fugaza level one, where they can go and try and uh, attain the Fugaza advanced astronomy qualification as well. So the uh, sort of a quick pricey of the qualification for those of you that may be interested uh, in it, there is a manual, a workbook, um, a theory exam, and then a practical assessment criteria. Um, and when we put this together, the idea was very much to make it a one-stop shop so that uh, all the information could be in one place and we didn't have to keep Googling things or have 10 different books. So this is by no means uh, an exhaustive list of what is in there, but we cover some um, planning of how to predict the best times of year, uh, the best times of the month in terms of moon phases and so on, and how to set up um, an evening and all the equipment that you might want to use bit of history of astronomy, the cosmology of um, discovering that the Earth was round and not flat. Um, I won't go into that one. Um, and uh, the heliocentric versus the geocentric theory that the Earth is the center of everything or we now rotate around the sun. We talk about some of the research that's going on in um, South Africa, particularly down in the Karoo region, galaxies, stars and star formation, celestial nomads is things like shooting stars, meteorites, um, comets, obviously the sun and the moon and the planets, and then a lot of emphasis on the constellations themselves, particularly with the mythology behind them as storytelling is so important for guiding, and then objects that you can see either with binoculars um, or with a, a very simple backyard telescope. This is not designed for people to have um, large telescopes on site. Um, it's very much more of a, a visual evening that this will set you up for. Um, so obviously we're very happy with this. It's been quite popular moving forward. And I think particularly now uh, after the pandemic issues, people are looking for um, some, some form of solace, some form of peace and tranquility, and to be able to give someone a guided tour of the skies as part of their safari experience or their uh, tourism experience, their visit to South Africa is very, very important. So if we go back to the beginning, why is it that we're all drawn towards the stars? I'm sure most of you watching this have at some point had a bad day and you've just come home and it's all been a bit too much. Um, and it's very easy to just go and sit outside on your stoop and have your glass of wine or whatever it is that floats your boat. And you just stare up at the skies and it's, it's a peaceful feeling and it helps to put the world into perspective uh, to some extent. Um, nobody really understands the reason why. Uh, I think a lot of it's to do with just how busy the world has become, how overpopulated, how reliant upon technology. And there's something deep within all of us that is trying to get back to our roots. Um, and this sort of ancient connection, whether it's in our DNA, whether that's romanticizing it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the simple fact is that astronomy is pretty much the oldest science in the world. And since mankind has had the intelligence to do so, we have been looking at the stars uh, to understand our world. Take these um, Bushmen here, whether, I'm not sure whether this was taken in the Kalahari, but you can just see there's no point of reference. So how do you, 
um, construct a society? How do you live your daily life if you have no point of reference? How do you how do you predict things? Um, and it didn't take them very long to start looking at the stars and start recognizing the motion of the stars night after night after night. It was a, a, a there's a cyclical process there that allowed people to start predicting when things would happen and when certain conditions would occur. Okay, so as we said, no point of reference um, for the early people that walked our land. So, as I said, they, they look to the heavens in order to understand their world. So what does that actually allow you to do? Well, if you can understand the motion of the stars and you start realizing that you see the same objects again at the same distance apart from each other, or the same time apart that it happens, you can start seeing uh, or start being able to predict uh, when certain things are going to occur. The sky seems to move. The stars and the planets rise in the east and then set in the west, just like the sun does, just like the moon does. So whatever uh, you see just after sunset in the east, if you monitor the sky's movement throughout the night, you will see the sky will rotate um, and those constellations will climb higher into the sky before setting in the west, just like the sun does every evening. But of course, it's important to understand that the sky only seems to move. And for you could think for early people, this is a very difficult concept to get their head around. Um, that what we now know, of course, is the sky does not move. It is the Earth turning that therefore gives the impression that the sky is rotating above our heads. If the Earth didn't turn, we wouldn't have day and night. Um, but it's a very difficult concept to expect early people to, to understand that the big rock that they're standing on is actually spinning in space. I mean, that was a, a huge psychological barrier for people to get over. So remember, it's the Earth that is moving and not the sky. Okay, so in terms of understanding those stars, well, it's important that um, you understand the motion of the stars and the, the poles of the Earth are pointing at specific areas, and it is around those areas or those points that the whole sky seems to rotate. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it's very easy. You can look at the North Star, which is known as Polaris. So if you're standing on the North Pole, Polaris will be directly over your head. Uh, and the whole sky will just seem to rotate around it and Polaris will stand motionless throughout the, the course of the night. In the Southern Hemisphere, unfortunately, we don't have a South Star. We have to look for little patterns of stars using binoculars. It's actually very difficult to uh, celestial align a telescope or a camera to the Southern Celestial Pole because it's, it's very difficult and you have to kind of guess where it is. Um, but we will use the Southern Cross and other objects in order to do that. Now this you can see here, this motion um, of the, the night sky uh, was actually taken out in Namibia and this is about 500 photographs taken throughout the evening which was then processed and made into a time-lapse video and you can see that the South Celestial Pole is right here and you can see how all the stars are rotating around this point. So whatever you would see here in a few hours will rotate around and then continue to do so. So these stars here, in this from this latitude anyway, would never set below the horizon. And um, so this is the point at which the South Pole is pointed at in the sky, what we call celestial south. Um, and as I said before, one of the easiest ways to navigate uh, the night sky and to find out your location, which is very important, especially for the early people, again, from a cultural perspective, before the days of GPSs and compasses and maps, uh, people had to use landmarks and the easiest way to do that at night time was to, to look at the stars. So one of the most famous constellations in the Southern Hemisphere is situated in this photo down here at the bottom right and this is known as the Southern Cross. You can see there are one, two, three, four very bright stars and a little fifth one as well which we call Epsilon Crucis. Um, so it is of the 88 recognized constellations in the sky, the Southern Cross or Crooks as it's uh, correctly known, the, which is the Latin for cross, is actually the smallest of all of them in terms of the area of sky that it takes up, but it is very bright and easy to see. And it's situated in the sky next to Alpha and Beta Centauri, which are collectively known as the pointers because we use those two in order to help us um, find that difficult point of sky where Celestial South actually is. Worth noting, of course, that Alpha Centauri, or Rigel Centaurus, being its other name, is our closest stellar neighbor after the sun. Um, so always nice to point that out to guests, that should we ever venture outside our solar system, this would be the next port of call. But it's also worth mentioning that even though it is only, say only, 
4.3 light years away. That equates to about 40 trillion kilometers, which is an, quite literally an astronomical distance. And to put that into perspective, if you were going to try and take an Airbus or a, a standard passenger plane of these days to get there, it's going to take you around about 5 million years. So until we make some pretty serious technological advances, I don't think we're going to have to or be able to get too excited about Alpha Century just yet. Um, but in terms of finding south, there are various ways of doing it. This is the most common and simple way. Uh, you draw a, a line through the longitudinal axis of the Southern Cross, sort of indefinitely, and then you take the midpoint of the two pointers and draw a line at 90 degrees perpendicular. And where those two lines cross, this is celestial south, and then drawing a line down to the horizon will take you to due south. If you can't see the pointers for some reason, perhaps there's cloud cover, um, or it's a time of the year, um, probably six months prior to this photograph, because this is now setting in the west when it's rising in the east, you might only be able to see the cross and not the two pointers, or it's um, distorted by atmospherics or something like that. Then you can estimate the length between gamma and alpha crucis and multiply that by about four and a half times. And we go for one, two, three, four, and a bit and you see we're in the same spot of sky. There is a third way of doing it which I can't show you on this photograph um, but the ninth brightest star in the sky which is called Achnar is just over here sort of would be off the screen but on a very similar line um, that the Southern Cross is orientated to um, and again the celestial south pole is sort of equidistant between the two so if you can see the bright star over here somewhere uh, the midpoint between the two will also give you celestial south. Okay, so once you can understand the stars and once people are able to start predicting that motion and seeing the same shapes, what we would now call constellations up in the sky, uh, moving across, then disappearing, then returning again the next night and at different times, at different times of the year, not only were people able to start navigating uh, themselves after dark, but they're also able to start predicting weather conditions. So for example, if Orion was high in the sky, which happens in our summer months um, in South Africa, that was generally associated with warm, wet conditions. The same, the opposite, sorry, is true for Scorpius. So Scorpius for us is a winter constellation. So when Scorpius was obviously high in the sky at a certain time, um, then we knew it was gonna be dry and relatively cold. So this allowed people to start predicting animal movements and when to find uh, trees in fruit. Uh, and this allowed people obviously to start getting a, um, getting a foothold, if you will, in terms of, of life. They were able to predict animal movements, predict where the animals were going to be, probably because where the water was. If you can predict the weather, you can do that. Um, and that just made things a lot simpler and people started to understand their world a little bit more. And then obviously jumping forward quite a few years in terms of civilization history, uh, we get to the time of the pastoralists and when people started farming and growing their own crops, then definitely knowing at what times of the year you were going to get certain weather conditions uh, was very beneficial. So when are you going to plant? When are you going to reap? When are you going to sow? When are you going to harvest? Um, we didn't have clocks. We didn't have the right terminology for understanding this back when this first began. But by looking at the, the, the stars and where certain stars were at certain times in relation to the sun or the moon, for example, uh, people were able to start understanding uh, how to best utilize the world that we lived in. Okay, and then this repetitive nature of the celestial phenomena um, led ultimately to the concept of time. And I think this is a very interesting thing to go into. A lot of some people might know this already, but it's surprising that how many people don't know this, that the whole world in which we live in, I mean, we worry about what time it is and what time our meetings and what time our kids have got to be picked up from school, our favorite TV shows starting or a sporting event. Um, yeah, we have watches and clocks and our phones to do that now, but all those concepts had to come from somewhere. And, and most, if not all concepts of or origins of time uh, come from people watching the stars. So I keep saying that they had to know or they were able to recognize certain stars in certain positions at certain times. And when I use the word time, obviously there wasn't really time back then. So that's a difficult concept to wrap our heads around. So you have to have some point of reference. So what ancient people used to do is they used to look for the heliacal rising of a star or a constellation or a particular object. Uh, it sounds like a complicated word, but it actually comes from the Greek god of the sun, whose name is Helios. So the heliacal rising is 
what star or celestial object is visible just above the eastern horizon, just before the sun rises and its light drowns it out. Um, so, for example, I've put in here the Pleiades, or what are also known as the Digging Stars, also known as the Seven Sisters. When you could see the Pleiades just above the horizon, just as it was starting to get light, that was an easy point of reference. You've got the horizon and you've got where the sun is. And that can be accurate to, to within one or two days if you're good at what you do and, and you can predict those positions well. OK, so here is that sort of uh, in a diagrammatical sense. So there's the sun and there's helical rising. Our object is just above the horizon before the sun rises. One day earlier, we wouldn't be able to see that object. One day later, it's a little bit higher in the sky and the sun would have been above the horizon. So this is the helical rising of a star. OK, so let's have a quick look at the, the Pleiades Seven Sisters. So they are associated with the constellation of Taurus. It's, here it is. It's a little open cluster of young baby stars all associated with each other and a very famous object and one of the most beautiful objects to look at through binoculars or at least a very low power telescope because it's quite a large object. But you can see from this um, screenshot I've taken here, imagine that we moved everything down um, an inch or so. If the sun was just under the horizon, the Pleiades here would have been just above it. So this would be the helical rising of Pleiades. Now to the Bushmen, they saw the, this little group of stars as ostrich eggs, uh, because this also coincided with the laying dates of ostriches, which for those Bushmen in the Kalahari and out in the Namib region, uh, ostrich was a very good source of food. Um, and an ostrich egg itself, of course, was a wonderful source of protein as well. So. Just another one of those ideas where they started looking at shapes in the sky and being able to predict when certain resources were going to become available. And ultimately, that's the origin of a lot of the stories behind the constellations is that how did that benefit or how did the um, being able to see that star or those collection of stars benefited the world and the society, if you want to call it that, that people were living in. So to a lot of the African communities, the Pleiades are known as the digging stars. Uh, and again, that's on account of the helical rising that used to happen sort of around the June, uh, the June, July time. So coming to the end of our winter, moving into spring. So it was a time when you saw the helical rising, rising of the Pleiades. It was a time to start uh, digging the fields and getting ready to plant crops because spring was coming. And that would be the best time to plant your seeds because good conditions are coming in that regard. Um, and in some African cultures, for example, they, your age and the start of the year um, was represented by the helical rising of the Pleiades. It became uh, quite an, an event. So it didn't matter when your birthday was, you were the number of years old that there have been the number of helical risings of the Pleiades. Um, and so this has been a, a, it's a, one of the most famous small collections of stars in the sky. And there are multiple stories from multiple different uh, cultures that all include this little, this little group of stars. OK, so celestial objects and their motion, particularly the sun and the moon, are the basis of most festivals on Earth. Um, now we're talking uh, again more about the, the cultural side of it. So there are um, many, many cultural uh, festivals that are celebrated every year and that generally fall on the same date or very close to that same date every year. Now, one thing I want to avoid doing here, and I obviously recommend to any of uh, people in the guiding community to do the same, is to try and avoid the pitfalls of discussing too much about religion and culture, because um, those two have been at loggerheads for many, many years. Um, but it is worth noting that the majority of festivals that are celebrated worldwide all have their origins in the location of either the sun or the moon um, at a particular time of the year. So let's have a look at some of those most obvious ones. Cool. Sorry, before we do that, let's just look at those obvious times of year that you can um, monitor and uh, predict. So the solstices, the longest and shortest days of the year, which is June 21st and December 21st, obviously summer and winter, depending on which hemisphere you are in. And the solstice is when the, the sun is either at the highest point or the lowest point in the sky. Equinoxes, day and night of equal lengths. So March 21st, September 23rd. Um, so the midpoint in the course of um, in between the solstices. 
Then we have what are called cross quarter days, which are the midpoints between the solstices and the equinoxes. So it's becoming a bit of a tongue twister. Um, and then, of course, the lunar phases, because people watched the moon, it was a little bit quicker than waiting for and uh, more accurate than trying to predict how high the sun was in the sky or where it was rising or setting on the horizon. So those are the four, um, or you can always call them sort of cardinal points, I suppose, that ancient people looked at uh, in order to uh, start celebrating these events. OK, so we can just see that um, in a diagram form here. So you can see, for example, the June solstice and the December solstice because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. That is why we have our seasons. So in the, the December solstice, you can see that the southern hemisphere is being angled towards the sun. And if you look over here, that means that the majority of the sun's rays, the concentrated rays fall on the tropic it's down here, the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, and so we get a lot more direct sunlight and it becomes a lot warmer. The opposite is true in the Northern Hemisphere, during Northern Hemisphere winter in December. Um, because of that tilt and that angle, the same amount of sunlight is still hitting that part of the Earth, but it's just spread out over a much larger distance and is therefore less effective. It doesn't give off the same amount of heat and, um, and light. It's shorter days and cooler temperatures. The equinoxes, the two points in between the solstices. OK, so Christmas, December 25th, uh, every year, has its origins, we believe, historically, in a pagan festival, which originally was there to celebrate the December solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, 25th to the 21st is not a big jump um, in terms of, of that. And of course, don't forget that, as it says down here, uh, calendars have changed over the years. The Earth is on a, has an axial wobble over thousands of years. So calendars now don't make sense to what they did many years ago. So we have to be able to extrapolate this and sort of work backwards. So Christmas is a potentially uh, an example of a festival based on the sun's location or the Earth's location around the sun each year. Easter is a little bit different. Easter is a bit confusing. It's not always on the same date. So Easter Sunday is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Um, so what the Northern Hemisphere would call the spring equinox, for us it would be the autumnal equinox. Um, and because it's the first Sunday after the first full moon, the date will always be different because the important part is the Sunday, not the actual date itself. Then you can take uh, Groundhog Day, which they celebrate in North America, and of course Halloween, which is celebrated um, in many cultures across the world. These are the cross quarter days. So these are the midpoints in between the solstices and the equinoxes. Um, and there are lots of different examples uh, of these in, in many cultures and many festivals across the world. OK, so let's now have a look at some of the ancient evidence. We, we're talking about all these ideas, but at some point uh, it's nice to always see some, something empirical, something tangible um, that we can prove that ancient people were looking at the night sky and beginning to understand their world. So one of the oldest um, examples of art which seems to depict constellations in the sky is found in France in an area called the Lasso Caves. And they've been dated to around about 17,000 years ago. So many, many, many generations of people who've been looking up at the stars. You can see on the left, this is the actual painting that is still preserved. And notice here that we've got a line of three or four stars with this little group of a few stars here. We have what looks like a little line of stars in the head of the, uh, of the bull that is depicted here. And if you know your stars, then you may well know that Orion is next to Taurus in the sky and the Pleiades we've mentioned a couple of times already. Now, it's quite possible that these stars here represent uh, the belt of Orion. Um, this here may be the club that Orion is wielding. And you can see this V of stars here in the face of the bull seems to correspond very nicely to the V of Taurus, uh, extending to the tips of the horns. And then just off to one side, we have the Pleiades, the, the Seven Sisters again. So, of course, there's no way to check whether or not this is 100% true, but it's certainly quite some compelling evidence that people were uh, depicting the stars uh, as a part of their paintings and showing that it was a part of their culture for, for tens of thousands of years now. 
Now, perhaps the earliest definitive physical evidence of an object that was made um, to represent the stars is known as the sky disk of Nebra, which is dated from around about 1600 BC. Uh, BC. It was found in Germany, um, made during the Bronze Age. It's about the size of a dinner plate, uh, and it's obviously it was obviously created for this very purpose. Um, what it was used for, of course, we don't know. Um, but you can clearly see here we have what looks like the sun and the moon depicted, uh, a smattering of stars, although I don't think anybody has ever uh, got to the point of suggesting if this was a specific constellation or not. This arc down here we think represents the, the arc of the Milky Way, the, the galactic core, that white diffuse line that seems to stretch across the sky. Uh, and then you can see this one is, is a little bit faint, but on the other side you can see this other bronze um, little strip that's been put on here, which we believe is there to track the, the movement of the equinoxes, so where, where the sun rises and sets in different positions on the horizon throughout the course of a year. Now, probably the, well, I wouldn't say the most famous, but one of the most famous examples of architecture that seems to uh, draw on stars and people's uh, watching of the stars is found in Egypt and of course is the pyramids two and a half thousand uh, BC to be dated although a lot of conjecture about whether or not that is the correct date um, and there is a very compelling school of thought known as the Orion correlation theory that suggests that the orientation of these three great pyramids two larger ones in a perfectly straight line and then one smaller one just offset seems to be a perfect mimicking of the great belt of Orion. Uh, you can kind of see here that you've got two bright stars in a straight line and then a slightly fainter one here uh, offset from the belt. Uh, and it does seem that, uh, that the, uh, the mathematics of it all seems to, to line up. Um, and also if you look at Egyptian culture, obviously we spend a lot of time discussing African culture and the most famous of them all, which of course is the Greek culture. Um, but there's some very fascinating Egyptian um, stories and myths and star lore that may also uh, add some credence to this Orion correlation theory. So in the Egyptian stories, uh, ancient Egyptians believed that mankind actually has its origins in Orion's belt. It was um, the I suppose you can call it the afterlife. It's where people came from in the beginning and it's where you go back to after you die. Um, and it was believed that the constellation of Orion represented Osiris, who was the god of the afterlife. Um, and you can also see here this bright star on this photograph is Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And if you draw a line through Orion's belt, it points you directly to Sirius. And in uh, Egyptian mythology, that was known as Isis, who was Osiris's wife. And uh, Isis was, in fact, um, known as the gateway to the underlife or the gateway to the to the afterlife. Um, so it was assumed that Sirius needed to be up in the sky in order for a soul to find its way from the pyramid, a pharaoh in this case, back up to the belt. Um, so if Isis or Sirius was not visible in the sky, then um, the body was put on ice, as it were, or mummified, and, uh, in this case, in Egyptian culture, until Sirius was visible again. Um, and then would be the soul would be able to be transport, transported up to the afterlife. So bearing in mind that Orion and the Orion's belt had such an important um, place in Egyptian culture, it makes perfect sense that they would build some of their uh, most famous architecture after such a, uh, such a constellation. Okay, and it's not just the pyramids of Giza that seem to have this shape, this one, two, and then three, the third sort of smaller one slightly offset. Um, you can see here that here's the depiction of Orion's belt. Here are the pyramids that seem to mimic that. And then the Teotihuacan pyramids in Mexico uh, also seem to have the same orientation as to these old ruins of the Xi'an pyramids in China. There's also talk of stone circles, a bit like Stonehenge in the UK, um, up much further north in England that are also set out um, in this same orientation. So again, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but it certainly becomes compelling that not only have we got the pyramids, uh, which have a specific connection to uh, the shape of Orion's belt in terms of their culture. But this shape seems to crop up in architecture from various cultures in, uh, on the other side of the world as well, which certainly I believe is um, evidence that people have been looking at and um, recognizing these constellations and these shapes for many, 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 many thousands of years. 
Okay, then um, one that probably deserves uh, a mention as well is found in North America. It was around about 1000 AD, so a little bit more recent. Uh, this is from the Anasazi Indians and is uh, in an area known as Chaco Canyon in New Mexico in, um, in the United States. Um, and it uh, worked similarly to Stonehenge, actually, which we haven't mentioned here in the UK, but as a solar calendar to start predicting those important times of the years, the solstices and the equinoxes, uh, based on the position of the sun in the sky. Remember that during a summer solstice, the sun is at its highest point in the sky and uh, vice versa during the winter solstice. And you can see here that we have this line of three uh, sheets of sandstone that it had been positioned in such a way that um, during the summer solstice, the, uh, the shadow that was cast through these, um, through these rocks would cut perfectly through this um, uh, this dial, I suppose you could call it, uh, carved into the rock behind it. And at the equinoxes and uh, the solstices, the position of this little shard of shadow would change. And it's known as the sun dagger because of this. Unfortunately, because it was an important site for people and it was a tourist attraction, it has been open to the public for a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of foot traffic through there. And obviously one thing we must always remember that, yes, it's wonderful to recognize these cultures and to share these ancient cultures with people of today's culture, um, but we must always respect it and not damage it. And what eventually happened uh, is because of all the erosion and the movement of people moving through and filing through and taking photographs, unfortunately, these stones shifted in 1989, um, so it no longer functions, but up until that point, it still worked. Um, so it's now been closed to the public to protect it, um, which is a good lesson to learn for all of these archaeological sites. Wonderful that we have them, but we must always respect them and not damage them. So again, just yet another example on the other side of the world, again, uh, of ancient cultures and ancient civilizations looking at the stars and celestial objects, in this case the sun, um, to predict times for things to happen. Okay, now we keep talking about time and it's something that I think is particularly uh, or is of particular interest to me, which is this whole concept of time has come from astronomy um, and people's viewing of the stars night after night. So let's take a year, for example. We know that a year is 365 days, but it was originally based on the length for one celestial object to return to that position again. So the helical rising of the Pleiades that we've mentioned a few times, that will only happen again in 365 days time. People didn't hadn't done the maths by then, but seeing the object in the same place at the same time just before sunrise was the equivalent of a year. Now months are very interesting. For many, many years, um, the most of the world operated on a 10-month calendar system. It's worth mentioning that, of course, different cultures have had different calendars throughout the um, history, uh, but the most common one that was used in the Western world was a 10-month system. Uh, and it was actually only made into a 12-month system quite recently by the Romans. So why did they do that? Well, the Romans had a, a particular interest in the moon. Uh, full moons were a, a time of great plenty and bounty and celebrations and festivals. And it was actually Julius Caesar who had spent some time uh, with Cleopatra out in Egypt. Um, and the Egyptians did have a 12-month calendar. But Julius Caesar thought this was a very good idea. And he wanted to align the number of calendars uh, sorry, the number of months in the calendar with the number of full moons in the course of a year. Now, it takes around about 28, 29 days for the moon to be full and then go through its cycles and come back to full again. Um, so we have 12 full moons every calendar year. Sometimes we have 13, depending on whereabouts that the first one of the year lands. But more often than not, we have 12 full moons in a year, which is why we have 12 months in a year. Okay, and we can prove that very easily. If you look at the names of the, the months and the numbers of the months, those of you who are quite clever should already be seeing a discrepancy where we can prove that it used to be a 10 month calendar because the names don't make sense. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. Have a look at the names on the left and see if you can figure out the discrepancy. Okay, how are you guys getting on? Well, if you need a clue, here's a clue. Okay, hopefully that will have helped most of you to, to figure this out. So obviously this is an octopus called an octopus because it has eight legs. Octo and eight are synonymous with each other. Now look down here, we have a month called October, which would suggest that it should be month number eight. And it used to be month number eight. 
until the Romans added two extra months. And what they did was add January and February at the beginning of the year. So everything else got bumped down two spots. So October used to be the eighth month, which would make sense. October, November, which nov being a prefix for the number nine. December, decimal points, prefix for number 10. But everything's been bumped down to, to allow the inclusion of January and February, which we have the Romans to thank. Four. And then they also, out of interest, they also changed the names of July and August. This used to be called Quintilus and Sextilus after the Latin for five and six because of the months. And Julius Caesar actually had his birthday in Quintilus, so decided with his power and uh, authority that he had back in those days that he could change the name of the month to July in honour of himself. And then a little after him, one of his uh, successors, Caesar Augustus, thought this was a very good idea and basically did the same thing to Sextilis and changed that into August. OK, so we've got the, and, and it's worth mentioning say, also that the year used to begin in March. Now, March, uh, remember January and February um, were not in existence at this point. So the year began in March and it was chosen to be March because that was the time of the vernal equinox, the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere, which meant good conditions were coming. It was going to be warm. There was going to be less rain. It was good for your crops and everything else. So the year started at the beginning of spring. And the fact that it's called March is no coincidence either. Also astronomically linked. So Mars, most people know as the god of war and anger and fire and that red color. But actually to the uh, to the Romans, Mars was also a god of agriculture and a god of fertility and a god of um, growth and good times which would make perfect sense to them, associate him with spring as well, good growing conditions. And that is also why that the, the horoscope and the zodiac signs, uh, which is also very important to form a guiding perspective because most people would like to see their horoscope sign. This is why the first sign of the horoscope is Aries, which is actually in March, not um, the sign that actually represents time in January. And that is because of this old 10 month calendar system. OK, so just very quickly, so these were the two months that were added. So January was after Janus, who was a two-faced god and god of doorways, which makes perfect sense with it coming into a new year. And February was named after a festival of purification. OK, so what about weeks? Well, we have seven days in a week. Why do we have seven days in a week? Yes, of course, there are biblical connotations to this, but uh, it comes down to people viewing the moon. Remember, the moon goes through its phases and it takes around about seven days um, for the moon to go from full down to gibbous to half to crescent to new and back again, about seven days per phase, um, which is why we ended up with a week of seven days. So we can even take it further to the names of the days of the week. These names, the, 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 the names of the days of the week had to be sort of important and given um, names also relevant to the stars. And especially for the, the Greeks, they were looking at the stars regularly and they noticed that there were seven objects visible to the naked eye that moved in relation to the background stars. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you go outside tonight and look at Orion, it looks like the Orion we all know. And if you come back in 10 years time and look at it, it will still look like Orion. Yes, the stars are moving, but they're so far away that it's not notice noticeable within our lifetime. However, there are objects that move in relation to those background stars, and those are the sun and the moon and the five visible planets. So something that's quite close to us, like Mars, you can go out and look at it every two or three days and you'll see that it's visibly shifted in relation to the stars behind it. And that is why the, the word planet uh, is used, because planet comes from an old Greek word planetar, which meant wanderer in the way that these objects seem to move across the sky um, whilst the background stars stayed the same. So there are our seven um, objects that move, the sun and the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. So let's very quickly have a look at the names of the days of the week. Now I'm going to leave out English for the moment because English has actually been bastardized by other cultures, Anglo-Saxon and Germanic cultures. Um, but it works much better in the other European languages, French, Spanish, German, Italian. So um, on Monday in English, we is named after the moon. We have Monday's moon day. And in French and Spanish, we have lundi and lunes, which comes from the word luna, of course. Then Tuesday doesn't work so well in English. We'll come back to that. But Mars uh, is the origins of, of Tuesday in French, Mardi and Spanish, Martes. Mercury gives us Mercredi and Mercioles. Jupiter, Jeudi and Juves. Venus, Vendredi and Viernes. 
Saturn, Samdi, Sabado, obviously works again in English now. Saturday is Saturn's day, and the sun, obviously Sunday, works fine in English. Um, has been changed a little bit in other European languages, but it still means the same thing. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for English are a little bit strange, but that is because of um, Germanic and Norse cultures. So Mars was the god of war, as we know, but um, in Germanic culture, Tu was the god of war, which is why we have Tuesday. Wednesday is named after Woden or Odin, for those of you who've watched the movie Thor, that's his father, which of course is where we get Thor's day from, um, kind of the Norse equivalent to Zeus with his lightning bolts. And then Friday, goddess of beauty, Venus, uh, in Norse mythology, Frigga, who is Odin's wife, was also considered a goddess of beauty, which is why we have Friday. So I think it's very interesting to notice that even the days of the week are named after um, astronomical influences or astronomical bodies. Okay, so let's talk about the constellations quickly. There are 88 recognized constellations in the sky. That's been designated by the International Astronomical Union. Um, and so different cultures saw different shapes and patterns in the sky and it became the ultimate storyboard and that's from a guiding perspective hugely important uh, because once you can navigate yourself around the sky and you start learning the different mythologies and the different stories you can see that you can actually start drawing a picture where you don't just talk about one constellation you talk about four or five constellations in the same area of sky because they all are part of this same great saga that's been played out often in Greek mythology as those are the ones that are most well recorded. So those Western constella constellations, it was first documented by a guy called Claude, Claude Ptolemy in 150 AD and, and a lot of the shapes were already there thanks to the, uh, the Babylonians and the Sumerians and the Greeks just then imprinted their stories on those existing shapes, as well as making their own shapes as well. And so we ended up with 48 original constellations, which included the 12 zodiacal constellations, the signs of the zodiac that we know so well. Other constellations, the, the next 40 were added over years um, by uh, explorers and other astronomers from different parts of the world. Now, obviously, which constellations that you can see are going to be very much dictated by your latitude. Remember, it's the Earth that's moving the whole time um, and we can't see around corners. So if you are based in the southern hemisphere, we've got access to these constellations here. But there is no way that somebody in the northern hemisphere is ever able to look around the curvature of the Earth and see these constellations. So they're what we call circumpolar constellations and only visible from certain parts, uh, certain points of the world. If you're on the equator, you can see the majority um, of all of them. But if you're in the Southern Hemisphere or in the Northern Hemisphere, there are going to be certain constellations that are just you're just not privy to. And the same is true when we view the Moon. So depending on which side of the Earth or which half of the Earth or hemisphere of the Earth you're viewing it from, you're either viewing it from the top down or from the bottom up, and your perspective will make it look upside down. So if you're in London or New York and you look at the Moon, uh, it'll be this way around from Johannesburg or somewhere in Australia and Sydney and look up at the moon, the moon will look upside down. The easiest way to think about that is sitting opposite one another um, at a dinner table. For you, your knife and fork and spoon and everything is the correct orientation for you. But to the person on the other side of the table, everything looks upside down, although their stuff looks the correct way round and vice versa. So it's just a question of perspective. Okay, so these um, seasonal constellations are important for, for guides to, to know, and that's why it's important, certainly when we do our astronomy training, we try and uh, recommend that we do refresher training every three to four months, because guides will often be doing um, a little night under the stars at around about the same time of the evening. And you can see that depending on the time of the year, because the Earth is going around the sun and as uh, different constellations become visible, um, it's a very, very different sky, and it's important that a guide learns that sky and doesn't get too confused. It happens to the best of us, um, but it does take a little bit of practice. So here's an example. Uh, what have we got here? Nine o'clock on the 20th of June. Um, you can see we've got Ophiuchus, Scorpius, Sagittarius. These constellations are sort of dominating the, the eastern sky as they're rising. If we look at 12 months later, uh, sorry, six months later, nine o'clock on the 20th of December, we can't see any of those constellations. The sky is now dominated by Orion, Canis Major, uh, what else have we got in here? Lepus the Hare, Gemini is just, uh, just rising down here. So none of these constellations here are visible here at all. And again, that's just understanding the motion of the sky and knowing what constellations are going to be visible at approximately that time of year. 
Okay, we can't really not discuss the zodiac constellations, the, the, the birth signs, uh, or whatever uh, people want to call them these days. But those 12 constellations were given particular significance because during the course of the year, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the sun would pass through those 12 constellations. So that does mean that on your birthday, if you go outside at night and look up at the sky, you will not see your constellation because your zodi zodiacal sign means that the sun is in that constellation when you're born. So when the sun sets, so does your constellation. So if you were to walk out at midday on your birthday and were somehow able to blot out the sun and could see the starry sky behind the sun, that is where you would see your constellation. So that is sort of what this diagram is representing here. So Leo, which sort of cuts between July and August. Here's the Earth. Here's the sun. That means you're in Leo. Obviously, once the sun sets, then Leo also sets um, and you won't be able to see your star sign. So remember we mentioned that Aries, uh, the ram, was the first one of the year, even though it's not um, January, uh, because of the old calendars. And then we've got all the other very, no, very well-known ones. You might notice I've put question marks next to the Virgin, because Virgo is often considered a virgin, although that is more astrology stories rather than um, actual mythology coming from the Greeks particularly. There's various stories pertaining to Virgo, neither of which actually mention a virgin in, in any way, shape or form. And it's also worth mentioning that Libra is the odd one out. Notice it's the scales, um, whereas all the other objects are named after either mythological creatures or mythological people. So you've got rams, bulls, the twins, crabs, lions, virgins, scorpions, archers, and then we have the scales. And again, remember the Romans like to change things up a little bit. Uh, the Romans actually introduced Libra much, much later than everything else, and they didn't follow this same idea that all the zodiac signs were named after animals and people. Um, so they named it after scales of uh, balance, uh, we believe because the equinox that day and night of equal length, um, we believe the sun was in that area of sky, which is now Libra at the time. So that's why they chose it. Okay, it's also worth mentioning Ophiuchus, uh, which is a huge constellation, very close to Scorpius and Sagittarius, so next to the core of the Milky Way, a winter constellation for us. Very obvious when you know where it is, but it's um, somewhat the forgotten sign of the zodiac. Um, and the sun actually does spend a full 18 days in the constellation of Ophiuchus, whereas it actually only grazes Scorpius, the scorpion, for a week, six or seven days. For some reason, and nobody really knows why, Ophiuchus was never included in those signs of the zodiac, um, but its position on the ecliptic, which is the name of this path of the sun, certainly suggests that it, uh, it should have been. Um, and then we have to look at the, the old dates versus the new dates of astrology. So according to um, astrology, as, as you'll read in magazines and websites, these are the dates um, which you have to fall under in, in order to be considered that star sign. So I myself am a August 26th makes me a Virgo between 23rd and 20, uh, 23rd of August and 23rd of December. That is what uh, astrology uses. However, notice the problem here that all of these are a perfect 30 days. And as we just saw on the previous slide, the sun doesn't spend a perfect 30 days in each of these star signs. Some it spends a week, some it spends three or four weeks in, depending on the path that it is taking. So there are some issues with astrology in terms of the, the science behind it. These here under where it says new dates are the actual dates that as of today, where the sun is uh, on any given date. So if I look at, take my birthday again, August 26th, which officially makes me a Virgo, August 26th, you can actually see the sun is actually in Leo. So by strict definition of today's calendar uh, and today's position of the sun and the earth, I would actually be a Leo. Uh, and if you were born between the 29th of December and December the 17th, you would actually now be an Ophiuchus. Um, and there are websites and horoscopes that now sort of respect this, and you can actually find a horoscope if you do happen to fall within this sort of three-week period. Just something nice to, to discuss with guests if needs be. Okay, quick thing on star names. I know a lot of people worry about the names of stars and it's a bit like having to learn Latin names for organisms. It's a bit complicated, but just like with those Latin names, if you actually see what the, the name actually means, it will make a lot more sense. So just a few examples of some of the Greek star names. We've got Antares, the big red supergiant in the constellation of Scorpius or Scorpio. And Antares actually means the anti-Aries, the, the rival of Aries or Mars. Why? Because Antares is red in color, 
Mars is red in colour and occasionally, because of its point on the ecliptic, that path that the sun and the planets seem to move across the sky, you have this big red star next to the big red planet, God of War, uh, and the Greeks thought it was a bit cheeky for Antares to be so close to Mars in the sky and also be red, so they labelled him the rival of Aries or the rival of Mars. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky in Canis Major, uh, means scorching, uh, probably because it's the brightest star in the sky, and its heliacal rising, uh, when it was visible on the sun, on the horizon, excuse me, just before sunrise, uh, also happened at the height of summer, so it was believed that the, the combined light and heat of the sun and the brightest star in the sky is what gave us the middle of summer. Procyon in Canis Minor means before the dog, because Procyon rises before Sirius, which is also known as the dog star. And we've got uh, Arcturus, the fourth brightest star in the sky in the constellation of Boetes, which means the bear herder. Um, and that's, I haven't got time to go into it now, but there's a very interesting story about how the Earth is actually being rotated by the great bears, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which we can't see here in the Southern Hemisphere, but they are being driven by the bear herder uh, which is Boetes, and um, the main character of which is uh, of that is called Arcus, represented by Arcturus. Um, and then, of course, the the Arabs also have had their say, and they've named many many stars up in the sky. Let's take Beetle, uh, sorry, Orion, one of the most famous constellations of them all. Uh, and if we look at some of the main stars in the constellation of Orion, we've got Betelgeuse, again, very famous, huge red supergiant star, which means armpit of the central one. Then we've got Rigel over here, the brightest star in Orion. A lot of people think that Betelgeuse is the brightest star. It's not Rigel is the brightest star, which means foot of the giant. Uh, Rigel as a prefix means foot. And Alpha Centauri, our closest star, it's, I think I mentioned earlier in this presentation, is called Rigel Centaurus, and actually represents the foot of the centaur, which is the uh, mythological creature Chiron, who's very, very uh, important in Greek mythology, represented by the constellation Centaurus. So wherever you see Rigel, that's referring to a foot or somebody's foot. Um, safe down here means the sword. The only other one of the four main stars I'm not mentioning here is, is Bellatrix, because that's actually a Greek name. It's a, it's a name, a Greek name for a huntress, uh, which makes sense with it being Orion. And then look at the three names of the belt stars, Mintaka, Alnilam, and Alnitak, which are the Orion's belt here. Uh, all basically mean the same thing, uh, referring to a belt of some description, a belt, a string of pearls, and a girdle. Okay, I think it's important to mention, um, just in terms of learning the constellations, that there are strict boundaries now around all of the constellations, so that anything that falls within this boundary, for example, is all part of the same constellation. The reason I bring this up is because in order to learn a constellation, you have to have that sort of pattern recognition in your brain. You need to be able to see a certain shape, associate that shape with the story behind it, and that's how you're going to learn. Um, but there is no hard and fast rule to say that if you're looking at the constellation of Virgo, you must draw this shape. It's not a dot to dot where you have to draw from here to here to here to here to here to here. Um, nobody's, nobody says there is a right and wrong way of doing it. So ultimately, as long as you look at this area of sky and you call it Virgo, then however you draw your lines and what shape you see is irrelevant. If you see a banana up there, that is absolutely fine, as long as you call it Virgo and you point in the right direction. And the reason I bring this up is because when you're learning it, most people are going to be using apps these days. But because there is no consistency between the apps, you might see one shape on one app and another shape on another app and another shape on another app. And it's hard enough to learn the patterns in the sky as it is without changing the pattern each time. So my advice to all of you guys is if you're going to do this, choose an app that you like, that works for you, um, and stick with it. Learn those shapes. And only when you're very comfortable with that shape can you start looking at other shapes. So for example, here, we've got two different representations of the same constellation. So this is Virgo, and this is Virgo. Look at the shape of the boundary here. We've got a straight line, a little jink, and then another little jink in a corner. If you look up here, um, it is exactly the same. We've got a straight line and a jink, and then a jink, and then a corner. So this area is exactly the same as this area, but the shapes within it are completely different. This is the shape I look for when I look for Virgo. If I had looked for this shape, I would be very confused and have no clue what I was looking for. My brain can't handle that much. So rather, uh, be nice to yourselves. Choose one app that you like, stick with it, learn from that one app. Don't confuse yourself by downloading 20 other apps until you're very confident with where you're looking and what you're doing. 
Okay, and ultimately, that's the best way to, to navigate yourself around the stars. Um, find yourself a recognized starting point. For example, Orion or the Southern Cross or Scorpio, something that you're confident of finding anytime it is visible uh, and it's not too taxing on the brain. And then you can start drawing lines through certain stars in that constellation, create sort of arrows that will take you to other constellations, and you can start to build up a bigger picture in your head. Best way to do that, as I said, is either by naked eye observation or figure it all out by looking at an app. Um, the two I recommend personally are Sky Safari and Stellarium for Android. Stellarium is also available for free uh, on a laptop. It's a brilliant program. Uh, anybody who's interested in astronomy should download Stellarium, certainly. Um, and then this bottom one is the key. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, we're so used to Googling things these days that our brains have kind of forgotten how to remember. Um, and you can't expect to go outside, learn 10 constellations, then not look at the sky again for another month and then expect to remember where all those things are. You're still looking at pinpricks of light and you've got to give the brain a chance to draw those lines and create those pictures and be able to recognize them again. So my advice to anybody is that if you're going to go out and learn three or four constellations tonight, fantastic. But you have to do it again the next night and the next night and the next night. Do it every night for a week um, and they'll be ingrained into your memory. And the beauty of this is it only takes two minutes. Um, it's not like you have to set aside a huge amount of time. When, you, when you're home and you're sitting outside and you're having your glass of wine or your beer or whatever it is in the evening, instead of staring at your phone and checking the football scores or looking at Facebook or Instagram, look up. Spend two minutes, five minutes going, oh yeah, that's that constellation. If I draw a line through here, I get to that constellation. And very quickly, um, you'll get it clear in your head. Okay, so let's actually look at that in practice. So here is the constellation of Orion uh, in the center of the screen, and we're going to use Orion to help us find various other constellations as we go. So if we draw a line, in this case, sort of going northeast through Orion, it takes us directly to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, and the constellation of Canis Major. If we draw a line through Bellatrix and Betelgeuse through Orion's shoulders, it takes us straight to Canis Minor, and here's Procyon, the ninth brightest star in the sky, or eighth brightest star in the sky. Um, so very easy to find. We've got Canis Major and Canis Minor now. Let's carry on around our sort of clock. If we go through Rigel and Betelgeuse and draw a straight line, it takes us right down to Gemini, the twins, and this is Castor and Pollux, uh, two famous stars in the constellation of Gemini. Okay, now we can go through, in this case, we're going to go through safe and then through Orion's head. And that is going to take us to this star here, which is known as Capella, which is the sixth brightest star in the sky. Always quite low on our horizon, but obvious when you see it. And this sort of pentagonal shape here is, um, so here's Capella down here, apologies. Uh, this pentagonal shape here is Auriga the charioteer. Okay, if we go through the belt in the other direction, it takes us straight down to Aldebaran, which whilst not one of the top 10 or 15 brightest stars in the sky, is a beautiful red giant star. And if you carry on that line through, we get to the Pleiades. So this is all Taurus. All right, guys, I think, uh, I mean, there's so much more that we could talk about, but I had to keep this relatively brief. So I hope, if nothing else, this has just given you uh, a little bit of an insight into, hey, how interesting it is uh, to look at the night sky and to understand it and how better connected you'll feel with the world and our ancestors when you do have a better understanding of how it all works, what is up there and how it's influenced society and lifestyle to the point where we use it every day without realizing it with things like time and celebrating um, festivals and things throughout the year. Uh, and I cannot hammer home enough how important this is from a, a guiding perspective as well. Uh, guests are coming back to South Africa now after all the chaos. They're looking for something authentic, something holistic, something unique, something powerful um, that tells a story, something that's going to leave a memory and isn't just the classic tourist trail. We are so blessed in this country to have iconic wildlife under such beautiful dark skies. Um, it's a wonderful photographic opportunity, but it's also a, just a great canvas on which to, to, to paint all these stories and discuss all these wonderful mythologies, be they Greek, Egyptian, South American, Aboriginally, and of course the, the traditional African style or from Zulu cultures, from Corsa cultures, from Bushman cultures. It really adds a, an incredibly 
human element um, to the experience. And uh, speaking from experience, I know that guests absolutely love it. It's something they'll always remember. Uh, and the beauty of the skill set that you can teach them is that it's not like you can give them all wonderful information about these lionesses here and how old they get and how fast they run and how much they eat. But that information is fairly irrelevant to them when they go home to their countries in the northern hemisphere of uh, wherever it may be. But if you've given them an, um, an interest in the stars and the, the given them the foundation to go and learn themselves, then assuming it's not too bright where they are and assuming it's not cloudy, they have the opportunity to go and continue this skill. And as, a, as guides and as part of the tourism industry, I think we'd all agree that it's just as much about education uh, as a, than anything else now. So anyway, I hope you've really enjoyed that. If you've got any more questions, you're welcome to contact me. My contact details, I'm sure, are in the, uh, the accompanying information for this presentation. And thank you very much for joining me.